Today we'll do some shading, then we'll do some chipping, then we'll cover it up with some camo, and then try to scrub it off. Then we'll polish up our wheels, all to get us to a point like this. G'day guys, I'm Clayton and this is Workbench Hobbies. G'day folks, welcome back and thanks for joining me. When we left off the last video, we had our model primed and ready for paint. Now I'd be flip-flopping on what scheme to do with this model and I really like some of the surviving Panzer 38s, the ones that survived the, the, the early part of the war and they got redressed in the dark yellow with improvised camouflage schemes and things like that. But the trouble was that most of those 38s ended up on armoured trains or used as fire support or transport vehicles, so I wanted to do something with a little more battlefield credibility. My way of thinking was all of these tanks would have started out in the dark grey or the panzer grey as they're so commonly seen. So I took a bit of a leap of faith and just started painting the model in the dark grey. As a note, semi-gloss clear is mixed in with the paint at this stage and by doing that the paintwork gets a really lovely eggshell finish and comes up with a beautiful smooth look to it. The paint is mixed to about a 50-50 ratio with Tamiya Retarder Thinner. Paint should be built up in light, multiple coats. Shading my model is one of the favorite things that I do and I always work in a top-down method. I'll focus on the horizontal surfaces and work my way down the model. A mix of German grey and light grey was concocted. I couldn't give you exact ratios. I'm just lightening the, the dark grey literally in the cup of the airbrush. The lightened mix of the Panzer grey is now applied in a mottled way, focusing on the horizontal surfaces of the model. By applying the paint in this random way, we start creating some interesting textures and tones to the essentially monochrome color that we're working with at the moment. And you'll see when I move around to the sides of the surfaces, I will work in a top down way. So I will focus my shading, my lighter shades on the top half of the model, the top section of the piece, and then feather and blend it out as it heads towards the bottom of the piece. The same technique is applied to the hull sections now. Breaking the paintwork up into smaller sections or smaller panels allows you to, to focus on those areas and concentrate your efforts, small pieces at a time, building the paint up, working on the top edges down. You'll see the engine covers I'm employing, the same technique, working on the top edges down, concentrating on the higher edges, making them lighter, and as it falls away, as the shape of the part falls away, it just becomes darker. With the first layer of shading done, you get an idea of some of the interesting tones and textures that can be added to the model pretty simply just by lightening the mix. But never one to be satisfied, I decided to turn it up a notch. The mix I had just sprayed was further lightened using the light sea gray and you can see I put a couple of drops of the Tamiya Retarder Thinner in there. This paint layer should be quite thin, which will make it quite translucent. So we won't lose the layers of paint underneath this layer. We focus on smaller sections at a time, building the shading up. So the idea being the lighter the shade, the smaller the area the paint will cover. And I really wanted to squeeze a little bit more life out of this grey, so I further lightened the mix using sky grey and light grey, and it was 
sprayed in the smaller sections as mentioned previously with far less coverage. I always work under the philosophy of paint light and weather dark. So I was pushing this one to see how far I could take it. And it's easier to darken the paintwork with oils and washes than it is to lighten it up if you've gone too dark. Paint light, weather dark. And with the masking tape removed and a bit of a glam shot, you can see the life that the shading has extracted from the model and how interesting it looks. This is before we've even put washes or any shading of any kind. This is just shading with the monotone color. It's quite extraordinary how far you can take it. And now it was time to paint some of the details around the model, such as the exhausts and gun barrels and tools. It's all brush painted using water-based acrylic paints using a fine brush. Elements like the gun barrels, the tools, uh, the jack are all painted using a black grey from Vallejo. And now it's time to paint the exhaust using tones of watered down greys are used to create some interesting tones and textures at this point. You can see I'm just dabbing the paint on in a very random way. By thinning the paint with tap water it will allow it to dry in a feathered fashion. Now we don't want perfect coverage here, we do want the random tones and the random patterns. So the first layer is being applied using a, a mid-tone grey. You can see I've just got the, the, the various greys in the bottle tops there. And just using a dabbing motion, I'm building layers of paint up. And adding some lighter tones now. And whilst it doesn't look like much at the moment, Enamel washes will really bring this part to life. Cork brown is used to paint the timber sections of the jack block. A steady hand and a nicely thinned mix of the paint. It's important not to try and get your one layer of paint down in one hit. I'd spent a long time trying to cut corners and, and, and get my brush painting done in one hit I was I was an impatient modeler but I've learned now you're far better off to work with a thin paint and cover the part in two to three thin layers of paint building it up is always going to give you a better more controlled finish and whilst I had pre-painted the tracks uh, they did get covered in gray overspray at the time of painting the bulk of the tank so the color of the spare tracks was just reapplied using black brown from Vallejo. When you study historical photos of the Panzer 38T one of the most interesting things about the tank was the polished ring around the wheels where the track would rub against them and, and essentially polish it. And also the horns of the track, you can notice they're quite highly polished. And the leading edges of the tracks also got very highly polished. So in order to replicate that, we just use an acrylic. This is an aluminium color, but we'll call it silver for the sake of the argument and apply it using a fine brush. Now the ring around the wheels is applied using a fine brush, being careful to just catch the high point and not be too messy. However, a few mistakes are inevitable. However, that's really easily cleaned up just with a little touch of gray paint. 
the guide horns on the drive socket also used to polish up so the aluminium color paint was applied to these sections as well it was probably a little sloppier than i should have been and i will address this a little later but this is just our first layer so i wasn't too worried now back to the exhaust and we're going to use some rust colored enamel paints which of course need to be thinned using white spirit this is the ak white spirit but pretty much any white spirit will do the effect is achieved by applying thinned layers of enamel paint over the exhaust part i would start with the darker colors first and then whilst they're still wet be adding the lighter tones to the top and you can see i'm just working in a dabbing motion creating some interesting tones and textures and by keeping that enamel paint nice and thin we can get some of those interesting tones that we achieved using that gray paint earlier just reinforcing some of the edges and shadows with the darker color and then going back over with the lighter color and the same techniques can be used on the tools So, tracks painted, tools painted, exhaust painted, looks great, ready to go. But where am I going from here? I was, like I mentioned, flip-flopping on the scheme I was going to do. And then I came across this. And I really liked it. It was quite unusual. It was something different. It was a field-applied camouflage by the troops in the field using a mud and gasoline mix, an improvised thing. I like the fact that the camouflage pattern wasn't your traditional dark yellows or dark greens or red browns. And the whole tide of the earth thing, I really liked. And I liked the structured camouflage. So I started researching this tank. Then I came across this photo, which I liked even better, but as you can see it's completely different to the rendering in the book i have same tank different rendering so which one was right and then i came across this historical photo of clearly a tank that would have been in the same area running the same operations so it's going to look a little bit like this in reality i've decided i'm going to try and do a hybrid of both of those images and kind of put it in the realm of plausibility based on this historical photo. One of the advantages of my line of work is I can recreate my own masks. I'd struggled to find this scheme and I really wanted to go with it now I'd found it. And I scanned the information that I could find and I set about recreating the mask for the turret numbering using Illustrator to draw the shapes and my vinyl cutter to cut the masks. The mask is sprayed using white and it's built up in fine layers so as not to flood the surface and we need to ensure we get a nice sharp edge on the number and something very satisfying about removing the mask and revealing the number on the turret. I decided to use the decals for the markings on the sides and rear of the tank just because it was easier and I was a little bit worried about color registration trying to do it with masks. With the decals freshly applied, the model is now sealed with a layer of Tamiya Semi-Gloss Clear. This is just going to protect the decals and protect the layers of paint that we've laid down and just ensure that our model is ready for any subsequent layers of weathering. I just did a little bit of touch up with grey paint here just to redefine the edge and give us a cleaner finish on that part. 
As all these tanks started their lives in the Panzer Grey, I, I felt it was important to show the vehicle's history that it may have had or, or service that it might have had before the camouflage was applied over the top of it. So prior to overlaying the camouflage that would soon follow. It was important to establish the chipping and some basic weathering. Small chips are applied using a sponge and Vallejo black brown paint. Now, this is a very light handed application. It is very easy to overdo this. So make sure you unload most of the paint off your sponge on a paper towel and then just work in a light dabbing motion around the model. Interesting effects can also be achieved by masking off certain sections and certain panels when you're doing your chipping and by applying a small piece of masking tape and then dabbing along the edge we can get a defined edge that makes it look like the engine hatch had suffered more wear and tear than the panel next to it. Again this is a really subtle technique and is just employed to add a little bit of interest around the model, give the model a little bit of history. For hard to get places, you could also put the sponge on a pair of tweezers. It just gives you a little bit more control over where you're applying the chips. Now, when applying the chips, try to think logically, where would the chips have been created? Where did the crew walk over their panels? Where did the crew get out of the tank? Think about high traffic areas, exposed parts, raised areas. They would have suffered the most wear. That's where you want to focus your chipping. And as you can see up close, the effect and the technique is pretty realistic. You can achieve some really fine, interesting random chips using the sponging technique. And now it was time to apply the camouflage. Now, quick tip. When changing paint types, I always change my airbrush. I find because the majority of the painting I do is with an acrylic lacquer or a lacquer paint, I find that if I try to run true acrylics through it, I always have issues with the cleaning and it's just not worth the trouble. And I'm lucky enough, I have a second airbrush which I've connected to my compressor here. And I'm gonna run the washable dust from Ammo in the hope that I can create some interesting effects. And I want this to simulate that mud fuel mix, that field applied mud fuel mix that would have been on the actual vehicle. And this product is thinned with a little bit of water and just testing how it's going to spray on the underside of the turret so I don't make any mistakes on the top of the model and it's a little grainy but it seems to be spraying okay and I set about trying to follow the pattern as best I could from the rendering and there's always something scary about applying or at least free handing these camo schemes because you've put a lot of time and effort into these models up to this point and it can all go south here if you're not too careful but things seem to be going okay for me to this point now this product is supposed to be washable i'm not really sure what that means and i, I do have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with this product however we will give it a try on this model so using a brush moistened with tap water i set about trying to remove and make the camouflage layer or the dust layer look like it had worn down over time through the weathering of the elements it came off very easily on the back which surprised me because testing it it didn't do that so i thought that was going to happen across the whole model the pattern I'd sprayed on the side didn't seem to want to come off like it came off on the rear no matter how hard I tried. It did tend to fade down a little bit but didn't come off like it was coming off the back of the turret. I ended up getting a cotton swab or cotton bud and just had to give it a good scrub to try and remove some of that pattern and make it look like it had been weathered and worn and was coming off the paintwork of the tank.
Given the hit and miss nature of this removable paint, or at least, I don't know, I'll, pu I'll put it down to use the arrow, but given the hit and miss nature of this paint, I just decided to be a little bit more careful with how I was applying it. And I was working in small sections, so I didn't give it much time to dry before I started trying to remove it with that moistened brush. I was just a little more precise with my application now. And as you can see, it just didn't seem to remove like it removed off the back. It wasn't bad, it was toning down and definitely coming off a little bit, but was on there to stay. And now it was time to continue the camouflage application on the lower section of the tank. In reality, this would have been applied with brushes or rags on sticks or uh, it, it wouldn't have been shot through a spray gun uh, because it is just a field applied mud fuel paste, if you like. Um, however, I did try some experiments with hand painting this on and it just didn't look right. So applying it with the airbrush just seemed to give me the look I was hoping for. So I just went with that and an old flat brush loaded up with water is flooding the surface and trying to remove a little bit of that camo paint we've put on. Uh, by dabbing a tissue or a cotton bud, I found that working in small sections and dabbing away and removing the excess water gave me an indication of where I was at with removing this paint. It certainly gave me a truer look at the finish I was achieving. And now the wheel sections receive the camouflage pattern. Didn't matter too much if there was overspray onto the, the silver parts of the rims and the wheels because again, in reality, this was field applied. It wouldn't have been perfect. It would have just been slopped on. And I'm not following any particular pattern here, just trying to keep it random. Now, often when you apply camouflage or washes and dusting over the top of a model, it can tend to just dull everything down. And I really wanted to try and keep some sort of contrast between the Panzer Grey and this field applied muddy paste. So I wanted to try and reestablish some of this dark grey through the model. So with a really thin mix of the Panzer Grey I tried to re-establish some of those areas that were toning down because of the work we'd done in the previous step. And I do tend to do this, I do go backwards and forwards with my models and it's all about balance and finding the spot you're happy with. Now using a very thinned, heavily thinned mix of red, brown and black, thinned with isopropyl alcohol, I set about doing a post shading technique to the model. Now I'm just testing how this sprays on the other side and you can see just by picking out some of the panel lines and shapes in the model, you just start establishing some false shadows or fake shadows just to extract a little bit of depth out of the model. Now I'm not gonna bother weathering the bottom of the model. I'm just literally using this as my test bed to make sure one, my hand is spraying properly, and two, the mix that I've put together will be adequate for what I want to do on the top of the model. For me, a successful model is always about depths of tones and depths of textures. So what this post shading technique allows me to do is to create greater depth in the parts. And you'll see that I just went around that wheel hub and then added a little bit of streaking, a little bit of staining. Now I'm going on the outside part of that wheel and you can see the depth that's created from that immediately. Now this technique does take practice and it's really all about your paint ratios. I would literally have maybe 20 drops of isopropyl alcohol or IPA or whatever you want to call it with maybe one drop of red brown and one drop of black. It is that thin. The pressure I'm spraying on is probably about 15 to 20 PSI for what it's worth. 
but it's all about control and it's all about shading. Again, this technique is very easily overdone. So restraint must be shown, just outlining the parts, working on the recessed areas, being controlled with what's being covered. You can always add more. It's very hard to take stuff away. So adding some shadows around the turret ring and you can see the depth that this is creating. This effect can be achieved in multiple ways. You could do it with oil paints. Uh, you could have done it with pre-shading, but I get so much joy out of using the airbrush and just creating tones and shades and building up layers. It's, it's where I get my joy in the painting. So this is one of the stages I, I really love. Now this kind of works the opposite way to the way we were shading earlier. I'm working from the bottom up. Dark tones at the bottom, lighter tones at the top. Another interesting effect can be achieved with this heavily thinned paint by just working the airbrush down in a vertical motion, just tiny bits of paint dragging it in a downward motion and you create really soft, subtle staining and shadowing that really adds that extra layer of depth to your model. Again, this does take practice and it does take time but it just shows you simple techniques that can add so much depth and so much character to your model. So all that work and we haven't even done a pin wash. Now pin washing is one of the most enjoyable parts of weathering a model and it is one of the basics that every modeler should learn. Now I'm flooding the surface using an enamel thinner or white spirit. This is just going to break the surface tension of the model and once I start applying the wash, it will allow it to run around the detailed sections and detailed parts far more cleanly. You don't have to do this step, but it's just a good idea, good practice. So using a liner brush loaded up with the enamel paint, you can see just by touching the parts, the enamel paint will flow around the detail, lifting it off the model. Focusing on raised details, hinges, hatches, latches, just adds that extra element to the paintwork. And then just a little bit of tidy up with a brush loaded with white spirit. It's able to clean up any of the mess or imperfections that your enamel wash might have left. You can see it was a little bit clumsy around these bolts. So a brush just with a little bit of white spirit dabbed around will feather the edges, tidy it up, move the paint off the model that you do not want there. And of course the washes continue up onto the turret sections as well. You can instantly see the level of detail just lifts to that next level. Really simple technique, but so powerful. So with the shading and the camouflage and the washes and the chipping done, I think that's a good time to leave this video. And I can promise you I've finished this model and the next one's going to be epic. We're going to focus deep dive on some weathering techniques, some mud work, some dust, more chipping. It's going to be great. I'm very excited. So please be sure to check in in a couple of weeks time for that video. I really do appreciate you staying with me all this way. It means a lot. If you do like the video, please consider giving us a like and please hit that subscribe button. It's really helping me. Thank you for allowing me on your screens. I really appreciate it and I do not take it for granted. Just remember, we are all in this together, guys. Be kind to each other. Connect with your community. It's so important and ask for help if you need it. Remember, encourage your mates to build and get into this hobby. It is the greatest hobby in the world and has given me so much and I know it's given you a lot too. Be sure to check us out on Facebook too. Until we meet again, I'll see you soon. Thanks again.